We're now going to consider the methods available to you to be able to calculate in a practical situation the latent heat of a substance. I've got two ways I'm going to talk about. The first of these is going to be using similar methods to the specific heat capacity and the, that helps us find the latent heat of vaporization. And the second method is known as the mixture method and that allows us to work out the latent heat of fusion. So starting off with some equipment you should be quite familiar with. Um, what we're going to need is a heater which is attached to a voltmeter and an ammeter. So that allows us to calculate the amount of energy going into the system. Um, a calorimeter, which I know the heat capacity of. And a, um, in this case a balance. Because one of the important features is to recognize the change in mass. Now what I need to do here is I need to think about the amount of energy required going into the system should be the same as the amount of energy required to change the system. So, the initial mass of the liquid is recorded. This is going to be assumed to be the mass throughout the heating phase of the experiment. The change in temperature is recorded uh, for the liquid to the boiling point. So we need to remember that because we're going to think about the amount of energy required for that temperature change. And then after that, the liquid is going to be kept boiling. As it's kept boiling, what will happen is that particles will evaporate and therefore the mass will change from the initial point. Um, after a set amount of time, what will happen is I'll record the new mass and so there I should be able to recognize how much has been converted from the liquid to the gaseous state. So energy supplied by the heater is going to be equal to the energy to raise the temperature of the liquid and the energy used to vaporize the liquid. That's my general idea. And I'm going to need to think about the calorimeter as well and just take that into account. So what will happen here is I'll come up with a formula saying that the um, voltage times the current times the temperature, which gives me the amount of energy going in, is going to be equal to um, changing the temperature of the liquid and changing the phase of a set amount of the liquid and also changing the temperature of the calorimeter as well. Let's consider this in a question. Three kilograms of water at 20 degrees was put into an electric kettle with a power rating of 2,000 watts, heated until it's boiled. Um, once the boiling's going, then we've got a further six minutes worth of time where the evaporation or the vaporization takes place and the mass changes. Now this example is really really useful because I actually only need to worry about the boiling phase. I think about the solution now. Pause for a moment and think how we're going to do this. Um, the amount of energy supplied during the boiling phase should be equal to the amount of energy uh, required to uh, vaporize a certain amount of liquid. So that means the amount of energy going in is equal to, equal to the mass of vaporized liquid. So that means the change in mass overall multiplied by the latent heat capacity. Latent heat capacity. Uh, the latent heat of fusion. If I rearrange this, I find the latent heat of fusion is the amount of energy gone in divided by the mass of change state material, which gives me a value of 2.25 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. So there's one example. Let me take you through just another example here. Now, again, try and extract what's given to you in the question. We've got 1.5 kilograms of water at 25 degrees centigrade, and the power rating is 2.5 kilowatts. We're being asked to calculate the time. So the question is slightly different, and remember it's the time required to do two things. To increase the temperature of the water from 25 degrees to 100 degrees, and the time to vaporize 1.5 kilograms uh, worth of water in the first place. So there's two steps we need to think about. Think about that. Pause if you need to, to spend some time bringing that together. Now let's look at the solution. So, two stages. Energy to raise the temperature, 
and energy to convert into steam. We can work out, therefore, the total energy needed is 3.86 times 10 to the 6 joules. Now, as we know the power rating, from that we should be able to work out that 2,500 joules is provided every second. So if we divide that by um, the amount of energy required by 2,500 joules, it gives us the amount of seconds, which is uh, 1,544, and we can work it out as 25 minutes and 44 seconds for it to be boiled away completely. The important section here is to recognize the energy going in and the different um, sections which we need to calculate that the energy is being used for. Um, now I want to introduce what's known as the mixtures method. This is a method to work out the latent heat of fusion. So the transition or the change of state from a liquid to a solid or vice versa for a solid to a liquid. Um, in this case we're going to use uh, the melting of ice. So it's changing from a solid to a liquid to do these calculations. Um, it's quite useful. Um, what's going to happen here is we're going to look at the change in temperature. We're going to have some hot water. We're going to place some ice in. Um, what I'd try and do, and there's lots of variations of this experiment, I would try and select ice which is chipped and is already melting. So the ice we find is at zero degrees centigrade before we put it in. Um, this is important. It just makes the calculations a little simpler. And then what we'll do is we'll place the ice which is at zero degrees centigrade into the water. Um, the water will change temperature in an attempt to um, find thermal equilibrium. So what will happen is that the temperature will drop down. Okay, So we want to make sure we're recording up to the point when the ice is completely melted so that dropping temperature has reached a, um, got to its minimum level. If I do that, I now know that the amount of energy required to cool the water should be equal to the amount of energy required to uh, melt the ice. That's the thinking there. So energy gained by the block of melting is going to be equal to the energy lost by the liquid and the calorimeter. Um, here, I, I said, by keeping the ice initially at zero degrees centigrade, it means that it's already going through that phase transition. So I don't need to worry about heating the ice or changing the temperature of the ice. And therefore, by doing this sum, I could then rearrange to find out what the latent heat of fusion is. Okay. So here's a question which captures that idea. 50 grams of ice is at zero degrees centigrade is dropped into a beaker containing 200 grams of water initially at 30 degrees, but the temperature drops down to 10 point degrees, 2 degrees centigrade. So all that information is given, we need to extract what we're uh, looking for. Uh, the final temperature of the mixture is 10.2 degrees centigrade, so that means when the ice is completely melted. Notice there's two stages here. Uh, first of all, the ice uh, needs to melt at zero degrees centigrade, and then that additional mass needs to raise up to 10.2 degrees centigrade. So there's two features there, the amount of energy required to melt and the amount of energy required to raise up its temperature. Um, at the same time, this should be equal to the amount of energy uh, required to reduce the temperature of the water in the first place. So that drops 19.8 degrees centigrade. Um, if we work this calculation through and rearrange for the latent heat of fusion, it gives us a value of uh, 289,800 joules per kilogram. So that's how we go through that calculation. Um, this value, as it happens, with lots of practical experiments, is probably a little low just because the heat capacity of the container is not being included and there may some, be some other heat loss as well. Okay. So this time the same question but using the mass of the copper calorimeter and taking that into consideration as well.
So the same calculation, but a little more accurate. I'm taking into more things into consideration. So similar method in remembering the calorimeter gives me a value which is which is higher. That should help you through with the ideas of calculating calorimetry.